morning. Did y'all enjoy that intro Hallmark movie music right there? Some of y'all are like, man, I feel like I'm at home watching the Hallmark movie. Uh, for those men that are sometimes forced to watch those, don't worry. We pray for you as well. I pray for you that we would be built up in the spirit to endure those movies. Well, welcome to Celebration Church. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Matt. I'm the pastor here at Celebration Church. Welcome to those watching online. I've already gotten some texts that uh, some people woke up late, so they're going to watch online. Those bed sheets were holding them down this morning. I, I told Colby on the way here, I said, man, I hope the rain doesn't you know, keep people away, but it, it does sometimes, but that's okay. Uh, the ones of us that are here, we're supposed to be here, right? Amen. So we are, um, we've been walking through the book of Romans. I know some of you are like, man, I think we're going to be in the book of Romans until Jesus comes back. And that could be true. I I really don't know. Uh, uh, But chapter 8 is kind of one of those big, thick, meaty, juicy stakes of, of goodness and truth and knowledge. And last week, we dove into the first 13 verses where Paul kind of talk to us about what life in the Spirit looks like. And he, he talked about four new privileges or, or assurances that we have when we're in Christ. And so one of those was freedom, right? <clears throat> See, when we're not in Christ, we are slaves to sin. We're slaves to evil. We are slaves to the enemy. And so when we give our hearts to Christ when we say and confess with our heart, not just with our mouth, but with our heart that we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are set free. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside us. And when we're set free, we have freedom, meaning that he starts off verse 1 saying, therefore now there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For, for all the people that are out in the city today, that are not in a church, that have never heard the gospel, that don't know Jesus Christ, they are condemned. They are, people don't want to hear that, right? They want to hear the fluffy, happy, live your best life now messages, but I promise you those kind of messages, when you don't speak the truth of the gospel, lead you straight to hell. And so if we don't know the bad news, we can't celebrate the good news. And so Paul walked us through a lot of the bad news in the first three chapters of Romans, right? Some of y'all were like, I don't know if I want to come back next week to learn more how evil and corrupt I am. But then the good news came in like, yeah, you were evil and you were corrupt, but now God has saved you to this. And so freedom from sin is one of those blessings. It's one of those assurances. I talked last week about how um, this chapter 8 is, is like a super center of blessings for all those of us who are in Jesus, who are in Christ. And the truth is, it's like infinite. I don't even think we even understand how many more blessings that, we're, that we don't even know about until we get on the other side of heaven. Amen? The second thing that happens when we become a child of God is that the Holy Spirit changes our mindset. He gives us literally a new mind. He gives us new desires in our heart. He gives us new affections. He gives us a new attitude. This is something that Josh and Sarah talked about in their testimony when we had worship in the park the other day, that Josh was like, you know, before God, I was wanting these things, and I was doing these things. And for many of us, that's also our testimony, that it wasn't like one day we just decided, you know, like, hey, I'm going to quit listening to secular music. At some point, I mean, that, that was the case for me. I never said in my mind, although, although BJ's set me on fire song was taking me back to my Nirvana days, so I just had to put that out there. I was like, man, this is like the Jesus version of Nirvana right now. But anyway, some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. You'll get it later. You're like, what is Nirvana? It's a group in the 90s. 
So started the whole grunge movement. You can thank me later. But he changes our desires. And one day, I just said, you know what? This secular music is not, it's not filling me up. It's not bringing life into my body. It's not bringing the living water into my soul. Now, I don't bring that up to try to condemn you. But if you listen to secular music, I just realized for me and my spirit, like, it, it just wasn't doing it for me anymore. And, and it wasn't like, again, like I said, well, you know, if you listen to secular music, you're going to hell. Although there's a lot of bad secular music out there. It's just the Holy Spirit began to change me. See, a lot of times we think as Christians, when somebody is condemned and they're living a life of sin, that it's our job to tell them that they're living that life of sin and how bad they are and that they need to become obedient. But that is not our job per se because we can't change their behavior. In fact, they can't even change their behavior. All we have to do is share the light of Jesus Christ with them. And once they give themselves to him, guess what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit's going to come inside them. And, and with the Holy Spirit and God's word, that will help them to become obedient. And until that point, what we need to do is we need to pray for them. Because see, we have family members and we have friends and we have co-workers. And some of y'all are like, yeah, I got a boss that is definitely headed straight to hell. I'm going to tell you, let me tell you what he said the other day, right? We all need to be praying for that boss, right? You don't need to tell him how bad his sin is. He probably already knows that even though he may not admit it. But once the Holy Spirit gets inside of him, or her, or whoever, that's when the obedience will come. Thirdly, the Spirit, we learned last week, comes to live inside us. It helps us to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Kindness, gentleness, patience, love, etc., right? It convicts us. The Holy Spirit convicts us when we do those things that we're not supposed to do according to God's Word. He, he comforts us. He gives us wisdom. There's a lot of other things that the Holy Spirit does, but those are some of the main ones. And then lastly, last week I said, or technically Paul said, that when we're in Christ, we have a new obligation, meaning that we are no longer obligated to live to the flesh. It doesn't take us long to get on social media or even to walk outside these doors and be surrounded by people who are living in the flesh, who are still slaves to sin. But we have been set free, those of us that are in Christ, to pursue holiness. And so today, in verses 14 to 17, we're going to be talking about the life of adoption. So not only has uh, we, we have been saved into the life of the Spirit, but we've also been adopted into God's family called the spirit of adoption. Some of the times in your, um, in your Bibles, it may even say that uh, above the verses. So let's look at our verses today. Let's look at 14 through 17, and I'm going to read those, and then we're going to pray, and we'll get into God's Word. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, there's that word there, as sons by whom we cry, Abba, or Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Listen, you've heard me say this many times before, those of you that, that are here, that are members, uh, and those that watch online, not everybody in the world are children of God, okay? Now, again, people don't like to hear that because in the culture, a lot of times it's like, well, we're all children of God. No, that's not true. The only ones that are children of God are ones that have surrendered their hearts to Jesus and are following Jesus and their treasure is Jesus. You with me? We are, however, all made in the image of God. And so we're all 
important. Every one of our lives matters. It may not matter to you, but it matters to God. He wants that relationship with you. You you were not created on accident, no matter what your parents may have told you. Okay? Maybe they weren't expecting to have you, but God was always expecting to have you. Your life matters. I don't care where you are in your journey of life. Okay? Whether you have a job or you don't have a job, whether you're single or you're married, whether you're a single mom or a single dad, whether you're rich or you're poor, every one of our lives collectively matter to God because we are all made in His image. It doesn't matter uh, what family you come from, whether you come from a rich family or a poor family. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. None of that matters because we are all equal at the cross. And we're going to talk about that later. Amen? Yeah. And I didn't even finish reading the, the scripture. I'm already preaching and I'm not even into the sermon yet. Verse 17 And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Now, pause right there intentionally, because a lot of times in many churches today and many online pastors, they don't talk about the suffering. It is not abnormal for us in Christ to suffer. We will suffer. Jesus said, to deny ourselves and pick up your cross and follow me. And and, and all throughout the New Testament and even the Old Testament, the Bible is very clear to tell us that there will be trouble in this world. There will be affliction for us in this world. The difference is God does not keep us from those things many times, but he's there walking with us as we go through it. And I don't know about you, but I take a lot of, courage and hope when God says in his word, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Some of y'all need to be reminded of that today. That's not even in my notes, but you're so discouraged right now, you need to remind yourself that if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? So Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And we'll get into that word. What does it mean to be glorified with him uh, later in the text? So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day, God. We thank you for the rain, even though it's cold, because you know we need it. God, I thank you for those that made, uh, or that you gave the courage to get out of those bed sheets this morning, to get out in the cold, to get out in the rain so that we could come and that we could worship together, that we could lift holy hands to you and give you praise and honor and glory that you deserve. God, I thank you for the food that that all of us or some of us have prepared this morning to eat after the service. I pray that you would bless it in Jesus' name. I pray that you would Take it and nourish our bodies with it. Father, we thank you for your love and your goodness and your mercy. I pray that these words would be your words, Holy Spirit, and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So now, just so y'all know, I've pre-blessed the food. So, you know, when somebody starts eating, you're like, wait a minute, we didn't say a blessing. You can say, well, Pastor Matt did pre-bless it in the service. So there you go. It's been pre-blessed. All right, so Paul tells us in these verses that our adoption into God's family involves three main things, and I've kind of outlined it in your notes, and by the way, if you didn't get notes, they look like this, except my version's already filled out, but you can raise your hand and we will get you those notes, Um, somebody in here if if you need some, but number one is intimacy. When we become a child of God... Remember last week I talked about that veil being torn when Jesus was nailed to the cross and when he was resurrected, right? Now we can have intimacy just like Adam and Eve had before the fall with God the Father, with God the Son, with the Holy Spirit, because we are now in God's family. The second thing is identity. And identity is a huge thing. And listen, 
I'm telling you now more than ever, identity is probably one of the most important things that we as believers and those that are unbelievers need to know. Because the enemy is trying to confuse everyone's identity. That's why there's people that believe that they are really cats. People that they believe they are really children when they're grown adults. And men that believe that they're women. And women that believe that they're men. And it just goes on and on and on. It gets. I even saw a video the other day. The girl says, well, I identify as a frog. I was like, what? What? I was like, well, here. Here's you a plate of flies. Get, get to work. I got some spiders, I got some grasshoppers. You just come to my house, we won't even have to spray no more. Those, those chemicals, you just start eating all of them. We'll see how long that lasts. And then thirdly is inheritance. So what we're going to see today is that because God has grafted us into his family, we have intimacy with God, we have identity is, is where our identity is found and we have inheritance. In verse 14, look what it says. It says, for all who are led by the Spirit. You're not a child of God unless you're led by the Spirit, are sons of God. <clears throat> when we look at verse 15, towards the end, he says, you have received the Spirit of adoption as sons. And then in 16, he says, we're not only children, but we're heirs. What, what does it mean to be an heir? Like there probably could be a whole sermon series on what it means to inherit the kingdom of God as his children, right? See, a lot of people in, in, in the world today, they get really excited about inheritance, right? And there's been movies made of kind of Hallmark movies, some of them, made where, you know, you, you, somehow you find out that you're distantly related to some king or queen, and you go to back to, you're in Europe, and they call you over, and they give you this mansion, this estate, right? Like, they make whole series and movies about just getting this magnificent inheritance. And what we don't realize is that when we are in Christ, when we are a child of God, we don't even realize the kind of inheritance that we have. Now, how do I know that? Because if we did realize the inheritance that we had, our lives would portray that more. We would live differently. See, some of y'all still don't get what I'm saying. We're rich. And some of y'all are like, but Pastor Matt, there's some zeros missing in my bank account. I realize that. There's some missing in mine too, okay? But we are rich in Christ. Do, do you realize that God literally, his word says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Like, it's not about money. There's so many blessings for us in Christ Jesus. If we just had a little bit of understanding of that, we would... Our world, the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we pray, would, it would change everything. It would change everything. But the Greek word for adoption, and I hope I get this right because I'm not Greek. It's called weothesia. And here's what it means. It means to have the place of a son. You have to understand that this word appears five times in the New Testament. It appears here in verse 15, also in verse 23. It appears in Galatians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 1. And so that's the first point that I want us to see this morning is that we as believers, we have been adopted. We have the place of a son. We have the place of of a daughter because we've been adopted into God's family with all the rights and the privileges of a natural child, right? When we, uh, as families, when we adopt children, right, what, what is the first thing that happens? They take on 
their last name, right? If I adopted a kid that was a Smith, now that kid becomes a Mackey. And everything that the Mackeys have, everything that the Mackeys do, everything about us is now theirs. And it's the same for us. Everything that God has, everything that he is, everything that he does, when we have been adopted into his family, it's all ours. It's all ours. And so what happens is, is that we have been rescued out of a life of slavery to sin, and we've made sons of God. We've been made sons of God. Just like in Exodus, right, when God led the Jews out of Israel, right, out of slavery from Egypt, we've gone from the outhouse. Some of y'all don't even know what that is. But we've gone from the outhouse to the penthouse. It reminds me of a show when I was a kid that I used to love to watch called The Jeffersons, right? We're moving on up to the sky. I don't know the other words because as a kid, I couldn't really understand. I would just mumble it, right? That's how mumble rap started, I think. I'm not sure. But just like the Israelites, we were led in the wilderness by a pillar of cloud. They were led by a pillar of cloud in the wilderness we are now led in our wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because, hey, we haven't got to the promised land either yet, right? So here's one of the most important questions that, that we can ask as human beings, maybe as believers or even as non-believers, is this. Who am I? Who am I? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Right, Because I think a lot of times in our mind, we identify ourselves as what we do for a living, right? But that's not who you are. That's just what you do. Come on. Some of are like, dang, I never thought about that. Or maybe you identify yourself as a mom or a dad. And again, you might be a mom or a dad. You might be a brother or a sister, but that's, that's not really just all of who you are, right? The question is, who am I? And then past that, the question is, who are we? Who are we as a church family, as, as the bride of Christ, right? And the first answer that I hope that you come to for most of us, for a lot of us, is I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. A lot of us in this room, a lot of us watching online, we are children of God, but hear me, listen, not everyone that says Jesus, Jesus is a child of God. That's why Jesus said, there will come a time when you will come to me and you will say, I've done all these things in your name, and I will say, depart from, from me, I never knew you. That's like the coldest, hardest words I've ever heard, right? It's, it's the scariest words to me in the Bible, because here's, here's the problem. If you don't understand your identity, you don't know your purpose. I'm going to say that again. If you don't understand who you are, who God says you are, not who your spouse or your friends or your family or your coworker or whoever else online says you are, it's who God says you are because that is where our true identity is found. If you don't know what your identity is in him, then you can never know your purpose in this life. And I can promise you that at some point in your life, you will come to uh, an agreement with yourself to be like, what am I doing? It usually happens between the age of 40 and 50. Has my life been fruitful? That's what you will kind of ask yourself in your own way. Have I made a difference? Am I making a difference? Who am I? And the second thing is, if you don't know your purpose, you also don't know what community you belong to. That's why I said identity is one of the most important things that we can know and understand. And we get our identity from him, 
who he says we are. Right? We sing that song, Who You Say I Am. Right? Isn't that the name of it? Okay, good. I thought it was. That's why I don't sing up here a lot of times because I, I forget lyrics. And my wife's like, hey, I don't think that lyrics, in, I, don't, I don't think that's what they say. I'm like, but it, it worked, didn't it? She's like, yeah, it did work, but that's not what they say. I just want you to know that. I'm like, all right, good. I can't help the creativity just flows sometimes. In other words, if you don't know who you are, you don't know whose you are. And you don't know why you're here, right? How many times have you been watching movies or you have maybe people in your life that say, you know what, I just got to go find myself. And they go to Europe or they go to Mexico and they, you know, get roofied and they end up in jail. They don't even know how they get there, right? Trying to find themselves. But I'm here today to tell you, to testify to you that this is where you find yourself. This is where you find yourself. This is where you learn who you are. This is where you learn why God brought you into this world. My mom used to tell me, just like Cliff Huxtable, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. She's not here today because her foot's messed up, so y'all you know, I need to pray for her. We don't know if she fractured it or stress fractured or what, but definitely needs prayer. But if we don't know who we are, that leads us into all these paths of trying to figure it out. And that's where we try to write our own story and we're like Jonah. We go the exact opposite direction of where God is trying to lead us. And the funny thing is, we think that we're making the decisions and we're, we're our own sovereign. And the whole time, God's like, no, nah, I'm bringing you all the way back to Nineveh where you're supposed to be. But we, we pile on a whole lot of affliction and misery in that process of doing that, trying to be little rebels. And I don't mean old Miss Rebels. See, here's the truth. If we are not his, we are his. Paul is clear to tell us we don't fight against flesh and blood. See, the media and, and governments, they want us to fight each other. Now, we're fighting against evil forces, demonic forces. And that's how it's going to be until Jesus comes back and squashes every bit of it. But let's go to point number two in our notes. When we know who we are, we know whose we are and what our purpose is in life. I may have said that wrong, but when we know who we are, we know whose we are and what our purpose is in life. Doesn't it make sense that if we kind of know what our purpose is in life, if we know what our mission is, if we know why God uniquely created each of us with our own giftings and talents and abilities, doesn't it seem like life might be a little bit more uh, joyful, right? To know, hey, listen, I know it's, it, 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 it's hard to go through what I'm going through right now, but I know God has put me here for this reason. I know my job is not really the job that I want to stay in, but I know God has me in this job for a reason for right now. Right? We have to know who we are. We have to know our purpose. Identity is so important, so foundational to everything. And listen, I want you to understand that our identity is not built on our performance. God does not need us to do stuff for him. God is self-sufficient. He, he lacks nothing. And so what I'm saying is you, you can't earn your way into heaven. You can't earn your way into being a child of God. I don't care how many you know car washes you do for the church or pancake breakfasts or how much food you cook for the eat and greet. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. I mean, it's good, we should do those things, but that does not change our, our status 
with our Heavenly Father. Are you with me? It's not about our performance. It's not about how popular we are, what family we were born into, because our salvation is not earned. It can never be earned. We receive it as a free gift of God's mercy. Amen? And when we understand that, when we know who we are, we can also know who we are together. See, back in those times, for Jews and Gentiles, listen, these, I know here in the South, we have an understanding of what it means to be segregated, but like it was even more segregated back then. Like Jews, Gentiles, they didn't hang out together. They didn't talk to each other. They didn't look at each other. They didn't break bread together. They were truly separated. You understand? And so in those times, for a Jew and a Gentile to come together and call each other brother and sister was more than radical. And only, only God of the universe could make that happen. Because in human terms, it would never happen. Listen, as people growing up and, and, and being born and living in the South for, for blacks and whites to call each other brother and sisters is, is radical, even in these days, to a certain extent, right? We have something special here at Celebration. I believe that we are the firstborn of many churches to come to be like this. Amen? Because the true bride of Christ in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, it says that every tribe, every tongue, and every nation will be part of God's family. And we can already see that happening. Not, it's not just a celebration, but I believe that God has really started to bring the bride of Christ together, not just at celebration, but across a lot of churches, even in this city and across this nation. Amen? But we are brothers and sisters who call on Abba, our Heavenly Father. See, a lot of people these days, they see church as a building, right? They see it as a building that you visit occasionally. Lord knows we got a lot of those people right? The visit occasionally, okay? I want you to visit like frequently. That was a joke, but it's kind of true. Or they look at church as an event that you come to for a few hours, okay? But really, the church is fundamentally a family. I'm going to say that again. Really, the church is foundationally and fundamentally a family. We are brothers and sisters. We may not be blood brothers and sisters, but we are greater than blood brothers and sisters because, amen, we're going to be together for all eternity. Now, for some of y'all, that scares you because you're like, well, you know, I don't really like so-and-so that much. That may be a little tough. But just remember, we're going to get our redeemed bodies. We're going to, sin's no longer going to be in our, in our flesh, so we're going to be totally different. But when we get our identity right, we get our community right, and we get our purpose right. I'm going to say that again. When we get our identity right, we get our community right, and we get our purpose right. And just so you know, and that for those that are guests with us this morning, or maybe even guests watching online, we believe we planted celebration on, on this vision that our purpose was to love people unconditionally, which, by the way, is not easy to do sometimes. Amen? <laughs> Some of y'all are having revival on that. But by God's grace and the, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can even love people that are difficult to love. And, and, and if you've never loved somebody that's difficult to love, it's probably because you're a difficult person to love. I'm just saying. But me on my own without the Holy Spirit, I can't do that. Why? Because in the heart of my sinful nature, I'm selfish. 
And that doesn't make me want to love people that are difficult to love. The second thing is that we believe that we're here to serve people. When Jesus came, he came to serve people. He came to serve and seek the lost. And then lastly, we're here to reach those whosoevers. And whosoevers is a broad category. But basically, it's the people sometimes that that other churches will shun away. It's the people that have been marginalized, the people that are are outcasted. But it's also the people that are popular, because guess what? The popular and the rich people, they need Jesus too. So that's why I said it kind of encompasses a lot of people, but there are many of us that are part of Celebration Church that honestly, you've come to me and said, you know, well, I, I went to all these different churches, but when I came here, I just felt welcomed. There's a reason for that. It's because we're trying to reach the whosoevers that others have pushed away. Amen? See, once we understand our identity, once we know what our purpose is, once we're in community together, and once we are children of God, we know what our job is. And just like Jesus, what did he say his job was? He said, I'm about my father's business. That, that's part of our purpose as, as believers as children of God is that we are here to be part about our father's business. Amen. So what is our father's business? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. They're going to bring it up on the screen and if you have your own Bible you can turn there. You may want to put that in your notes. I did not put it in your notes. Here's what it says in verse 16. In the same way, this is Jesus speaking here, let your light shine before others so that, or therefore, they may see your good works. Now, I want to pause right there. We're not letting our light shine so I can be like, oh, look at me. Look how the wonderful and good things that Pastor Matt does. No, that's not what it's saying here because we got the rest of this verse here. It says, and give glory to who? Not to ourselves, to your Father who is in heaven. So, in other words, the purpose of doing the good works, the purpose of being the light to others who are in darkness is to give glory to our Father who's in heaven. Amen? See, the thing is, how will they see in the dark? How many times have you been awakened at night and it's pitch black dark and you're trying to make it somewhere like the bathroom for example but you can't see and you're bumping into everything and you're stubbing your toe right you're saying mumbling some bad words that you shouldn't be mumbling you feel like your wife has set things in the way to booby trap you on the way to the bathroom come on that's how it is spiritually for people who are lost How can they see in the dark if there's no light? Guess who's the flashlight? Us. Us. But how would they know? How would they see if we don't tell them? If we are not the light of Christ. Amen? So what's our purpose? To glorify God. To let our light shine and enjoy Him forever. See, we not only have a new identity, but now that we are sons and daughters, we can enjoy a new intimacy with God. That's what we see in verses 15 and 16. Paul shows us several ways that the Spirit brings us intimacy with the Father. He says the Spirit confirms that a change has taken place. In other words, this is point three in your notes, is that we know we belong to God by the Spirit of God. Sometimes people come to me and they say, well, Pastor Matt, I don't, you know, I don't really know if I'm saved. I don't know, really know if I'm a child of God. <clears throat> and one of the things that 
we talk about is like, hey, the Spirit will confirm that you're a child of God. So maybe you need to pray on it some more. Maybe you need to look through the Scriptures some more. But there's lots of other things, too, that go along with that. Like we will manifest the fruit of the Spirit. But also the Spirit will confirm that we are a child of God. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 10, this is, this is what he said in verses 27 and 28. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. That's what I mean sometimes when I say it's not just to, to know who God is, but for him to know us, right? For him to know us. I know them and listen, they follow me. So not only does the Spirit confirm that you're a child of God, and if you're a child of God, you should be exhibiting fruit as a child of God. In fact, John says they will know that we are children of God, so to speak, if they see by the love we have for each other, right? But also that we follow Christ, that we obey. How do we follow him? We obey his commandments. We treasure him. We treasure him above all things in this life. And then he goes on to say, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And here's another reason I mentioned this last week that I don't believe we can lose our salvation. He says, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. He goes on to say that later in those verses that no one can snatch us out of the father's hand. So I'm like, if Jesus says, look, you can't snatch my sheep out of my hand. You can't snatch my sheep out of the Father's hand. I'm pretty sure that my salvation is eternally secure. I can't lose it. Okay? That's why, among many other verses, that I think that way. Okay? You don't have to agree with me, but that's why I think that way. When Paul says in, in verse 15, the spirit of adoption, that essentially means the spirit who confirms our adoption. In verse 16, he says, the spirit himself says or testifies that we are children of God. And so not only does the spirit confirm we are his, but also this is what happens when that, that happens. Our fear is replaced, listen, with acceptance and security. I'm going to say that again because this is really important. When we become children of God, our fears, well, 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 what fears are you talking about? Any fear, specifically probably things of not being accepted. So our fear of, of being unaccepted by people or whosoever, right? Whoever's out there, family members or friends or coworkers, our security those are the fears that I'm talking about. Those are replaced with acceptance and security. And that's point number four in your notes. Listen, have you ever wondered? You probably haven't, but I have. Have you ever wondered why people join gangs? I'm not talking about cool in the gang. I'm talking about like gangs, like bloods and crips, like we're going to kill each other. Have you ever thought, like, why would somebody do that? That's, like, crazy. Well, it's not when you think about human nature because as humans, we all want acceptance. I believe, this is just Pastor Matt's opinion here, that people join gangs because they're looking for acceptance. They're looking for security. They're looking for, hear me, a family. I'm telling you, if you were to, to interview, as, as they say, some OGs, some of y'all, y'all may like Googling that Urban Dictionary, like, what is he saying today? I guarantee you, they would tell you, I got into the gang because I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be safe. Right? I, I, I wanted it because they seemed like they were this big family that had each other's back. Do you see why it's important now to be part of God's family? Because I believe just like he put in our DNA that we are worshipers, 
I believe he put a longing, a wanting for us to be part of a family. Because a lot of us have a lot of different family backgrounds. Some of us didn't have a father. Some of us didn't have a mother. Some of us didn't even have parents at all. And I can guarantee you from a very young child into an adult, you are always wanting a family. You are always wanting to be accepted. You are always wanting to be loved. And you are always wanting to be secure. And all of that can truly, to the nth degree, be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why, too, I believe kids succumb to peer pressure, right? They do it because they want to be accepted. Right? Like all the teachers in the room like, yep. Yeah. Yeah, they want to be part of the cool kids. They don't want to be isolated. That's what happens because, but they're looking for that acceptance in the wrong places. They're looking for it in all the wrong places. But because we have been grafted in, our freedom and security now rule instead of fear and bondage. And not only that, because we cry out to our Heavenly Father, He knows us and He hears us. That's the last part of of, uh, point number four. Because here's the thing, sometimes in in our extreme weakness, sometimes in our extreme uh, poverty of spirit and our desperation, all we can manage to do sometimes in our prayers is to say, Father, Abba. Remember when Jesus was about to be crucified and he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He, he, he was so troubled by what he was going to have to endure, which was the wrath of God. All of the world's sins put onto him that he began to sweat profusely and he was sweating blood. And the first thing that he says is Abba. From the depths of his desperation, he says, Abba. He cries out, Abba. Sometimes we're so broken hearted by life that all we can get out is Father. And on our worst days and our worst times when all we can manage to get out is Father, He still hears us and He still answers us. So if in your, you're in that place today, in this moment, or watching, or here today, if you're in a really bad place, I can promise you that if you cry out to him, even if you're not a child of God yet, he hears you. And if you're not a child of God yet, I would encourage you to ask to be one, to ask Jesus to come into your heart, to trust on him, to believe that he is the son of God, that he's coming back, that he was crucified on a cross over 2,000 years ago for our sins, for your sins, for my sins, and that three days later he rose again so that we could rise again one day with him in, in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen? He hears our groaning. He hears our cries. And in those cries and in those groanings, the Spirit will testify with us that we are a child of God. And so we have this new identity, we have this new intimacy that we didn't have before with God, but lastly, we have a new inheritance. Paul says in verse 17 that if we are children, then we're also heirs. As good as everything is here on earth when we become a child of God, the best part is yet to come. We've gone from slaves to sin to heirs with the king of the universe. But there's one last thing that I don't want to skip over today, and some of you, especially the women in the room or watching online, may be wondering about this. But why does Paul say at the very beginning of verse 14 that all who are led by the Spirit, are sons of God. Why doesn't he say sons and daughters, right? You have to understand that in those times of history that the sons always received the inheritance. That's why it was such a big deal 
if you couldn't have kids or if you never had a son back then because you were worried, well, who's going to get my inheritance, right? And so I want you to understand, especially the women in the room, that in the gospel, all Christians are sons and daughters, okay? When they say sons, they mean daughters as well. And here's where I rest on that. Galatians 3.28 says it this way, and I don't think I gave you this, uh, Gabe, so don't worry about it. But it says it this way, there is neither Jew nor Greek, right? There's neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. In, in other words, what Paul is saying here. To the to the, the Galatian church is, man, listen, there's no more black and white. There's no more Asian. There's no more Indian. There's no more rich. There's no more poor. There's even no more male or female. In Christ, we are all children. We are all equal at the cross. Amen? So anytime you hear them say sons, I want you to understand that it also means daughters, okay? I I didn't want to skip over that. But lastly, I also want to mention that our adoption as children of God has an already and a not yet part to it. The already is what we're experiencing now. Okay, but here's the not yet part. And uh, Gabe, I think I did give you this. If we could go to chapter, in chapter 8 of Romans, verses 22 and 23. Um, he kind of picks up on this point a little later. So here's what it says. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. See, right now, all of us that are in Christ are experiencing those first fruits of the Spirit. But our spirit still groans inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters for the redemption of our bodies. See, the not yet part is the part where Jesus comes back, okay? And if we are dead already when Jesus comes back and we're with him in heaven, When he comes back, he's literally going to resurrect our bodies and we will have our glorified body. So just like when Jesus died and was resurrected, right? He came back and he witnessed to over over 500 people witnessed over the 40 days that he walked the earth after his resurrection. In fact, remember with Doubting Thomas, he's like, hey, Put, put your finger in, my, in, in the nail holes, like touch me. He ate food, like, but his body was different. It was his glorified body. It was his resurrected body. It was his redeemed body. See, there's coming a time where our bodies will never age. I said there's coming a time where our bodies will never age. I figured the women would be like, oh, there's not going to be any more wrinkles is what I'm saying. Okay? There's not going to be any uh, beer bellies no more. Like, I don't know how ripped we're going to be. I I don't know. But in our redeemed bodies, they're they're not going to age. They're going to look good. But the most important thing is we no longer have to deal with sinful nature at all for all eternity. There's no more sin in the flesh. Amen? So that's the not yet part. We're still awaiting the redemption of our bodies. That's what Paul is saying there in those verses. We already have the first fruits. We've already been legally adopted by God. But we wait for the final part of our adoption when our bodies are fully redeemed and raised from the dead. And BJ, you can come on up. I'm closing. And that's one of the reasons I don't want us to be fearful, like I talked about last week, of Jesus' return. Like, it's not something that we need to be fearful of. It should be something that we should be joyful about, that we should be anticipating, that we should be ready for. 
Because a lot of good stuff for us that are in Christ is going to happen when he comes back. Amen? But I want to close and remind us of, of what we've read today. Namely, that the Spirit of God assures us that we are his children. And not only his children, but we are his heirs. That means that everything that God is and everything that God has will become ours. And our adoption has started, but is not yet complete. We await our resurrection, our redeemed bodies. We aren't home yet, but we're still awaiting glory in our glorified, redeemed bodies. But in the meantime, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We have intimacy. We have a new freedom. We're no longer obligated to the flesh. We have a new identity, a new intimacy, a new inheritance. And we have the Holy Spirit to empower us to be the light, to be about our Father's business, to enable us in times of suffering to cry out, Abba. And in the meantime, we also have His Word to help us persevere, to help encourage us, to build us up. And we know that glory is coming and His name is is Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me today as we begin to respond and in, in, in worship one more time? And after we respond in worship, worship I will uh, close us in prayer uh, over our offering and our tithes. And listen, if I forget to say it, I want to say it now that if you are a guest with us today, if you're a guest watching online, there's an online form you can fill out. But here um, in, the, in the sanctuary, there's little blue cards called a connect card. Uh, they're behind every chair. We have two black boxes on the back wall, my right, your left, where you can fill that out. You can drop it in uh, to that box. If you have a prayer request, we would love to partner with you in prayer uh, we would love to just say thank you for worshiping with us today and visiting. We also have a gift for you out here. If you're a guest with us today, a first-time guest, that we would like to give you as well. And listen, when you put your information on that card, I want you to know that it's not so we can show up at your house and expect you to make us breakfast or uh, gluten-free, of course, or some really good coffee or bother you. It's really so we can partner with you in prayer, so we can say thank you for coming, thank you for visiting, um, thank you for uh, just being here with us to celebrate God's goodness and who He is. So listen, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor BJ, and he's going to lead us in this song, and then we'll pray for our offering.